Okay, good morning everybody. Thank you for coming ridiculously early in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you've all tucked into breakfast. Um, we're a small but select group here. Um, so, we're going to start off um, with a little um, introduction um, from John, I think. Um, yes, is that right? Who's going to give us a presentation? Yes. Um, and then we're going to hear from um, some of our speakers. Um, sorry, I didn't say who I was, did I? Early in the morning. Uh, my name is Alex Mayer. Um, I'm a former um, member of the European Parliament for the East of England, which is Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, Hertfordshire, Cambridgeshire, Bedfordshire. We've got some Norfolk representatives here, I can see. Um, so, um, we'll be talking this morning um, about how regeneration can be done sustainably. Um, so, let's first of all kick off um, with the presentation. So, yeah, I'm Oliver Lowry. Uh, this is my business partner, John Atroyd. Uh, and um, eight years ago, we set up Akron Lowry, which is an architect's practice. Um, so we, we realised that being architects, we're quite a long way down the sort of decision-making process. Um, and so we actually set up this, this breakfast briefing club. So we run this, this event every couple of months to try and bring together decision-makers, politicians, planners, and the industry um, to kind of sort of discuss policy and, and see how we can better create sustainable cities in the future. So, as a practice, we specialise in urban regeneration <coughs> projects. Um, Top Right is a project that was recently uh, awarded the retrofit, uh, AJ Retrofit Award. Um, we've got a big retrofit project in um, Hamwell Magistrates Court, which is the bottom left, and then uh, the other schemes are some large scale regeneration projects. And John and I's background, we worked for 10 years at a company called Archetype, who were pioneers of the sustainability movement. Um, they specialised in passive house, and John was actually lucky enough to work at, uh, for two years doing a, a government-funded post-occupancy evaluation um, on one of the buildings that we actually designed together. Um, so looking at the, uh, the sort of happiness of the people in it, and also the energy use. So it's a really fascinating way of, of, of understanding how effective our low energy design principles had been. But at the end of that process, I think we realised that this isn't the problem. You know, the energy and uh, climate crisis facing us is not something that's going to be fixed building by building. It's a global problem. We need a larger scale solution. And that is why we set up Aquary Lowry. We set up the Breakfast Briefing Club. This idea needs to be discussed at a city scale, a global scale. And that's, that's, that's really why we're here, talking to decision makers, politicians about building a, a greener future. So there is now in place a target, which is helpful, so carbon net zero by 2050, <coughs> but there's not really a roadmap of how we actually get there. What we do know is that buildings produce 37% of, of our carbon emissions, uh, and that urban populations are increasing. Therefore, we think that it's, it's sort of obvious that cities are crucial to achieving our goals. Um, and the current approach is to use building regulations as a sort of lever um, to target new dwellings. And, you know, safely say that within five years, you would expect that a new built dwelling will be operationally net zero. And, and that's fantastic. Absolutely, you know, that, that's a great starting point. However, and that's it's done through high thermal performance, basically, improving windows, wall thicknesses, uh, and on-site renewables. But, what you can see, this is a slide we've got from Savile's Earth. On the left-hand side, that's what part L will give you. It's a, it's a very low, zero, regulated energy uh, in the operational side of the building. But once you study a microwave, I guess, regulated load, it over -doubles. You then add in embodied carbon, the carbon that's required to build it, you add more on the top. And then the transport emissions, uh, operational stuff, and business transport, actually, so um, with that in mind, we've got four uh, kind of key discussion points that we think uh, would be useful to discuss, and John is going to uh, talk about those. Fantastic, thank you, Ollie. Just stand up, thank you. Um, well, thank you, Ollie. That's good introduction. I think. It's been great to be at a conference, by the way, and hearing the leader uh, yesterday talk about it, and Ed Miliband about the kind of ambition. Actually, we're talking about 2030 now, but I've been hearing 
and that's fantastic, that's what we need to see, uh, if we can make those changes. But it's not very long away, so we put forward kind of four ideas about how can we actually start to implement this and how can we build a roadmap to deliver uh, on this goal. I think retrofit first is absolutely a part of it. Um, the only 1% of um, UK building stock is uh, new build, so 99% of our problems in existing buildings. Um, and they're hard to do and they're complicated to do and that's why people avoid it but I think we've got, head, we've got to focus head on on this. Um, Ed Miliband yesterday announced um, 60 billion which is fantastic that we would put forward for doing uh, retrofit but actually that only makes about 50 pounds per house. You know, so you realise the scale of the problem we've got here. So it can't just be money, it's actually going to have to be you know, other levers but it's a very good, good start. So um, we... <laughs> um, we've got some suggestions. So, yeah, not long. We need to remove the AT, we think, on refurbishment at the moment. There's a, a preference, effectively, for new build, which is VAT free. So, that's a sort of national policy. We also think that stamp duty rebate on EPC. So, if you improve your house when you move in, you get a rebate, which will have a significant impact. The planning system already does start to favour retrofit, but that could be stronger. There's various policies that could be put in the locally and nationally to encourage that. We think there's an opportunity here, it's great to see uh, leaders from around the country and in different boroughs, but this is a great opportunity for jobs. Um, there's a huge skills gap and it's a good job, so actually building a program with new jobs to start implementing these changes and we can be world leaders in this, I think. Um, and I think the only thing on retrofit, there needs a bit of flexibility of thinking. Not every building's different when they're existing, so there needs to be um, some thought about some flexibility. You can't always get the energy in existing buildings as low as new buildings, but we should be doing something because the stock for 99%, we can get 80, you know, get 80% of the savings quite easily. We should take it. So that's the first point. Second point, again, we mentioned a lot of the, the conference this week, but decarbonising the grid has a massive opportunity for us because we've got great wind resources in the UK. With, um, both onshore and offshore. One of the things we've been talking about is actually you can do onshore within a few months. We talk about energy security for the current climate, and actually you can get a wind farm up in a few months, six months, so. So we were talking about, and I know it's probably unpopular to certain things, but we're in a climate emergency, so could we get wind farms up more quickly, maybe on a temporary basis, that could then be when we get other more uh, long-term kind of power online, we could then perhaps take them down, because they are um, movable. The restructuring the grid, so this shows the national policy we see. If we decarbonise, actually, when everyone's got electric cars, we're seeing them increasingly being used. But actually, the, the electricity is going to be in the wrong place, so it's not going to work. So there needs to be some real vision about infrastructure um, that is place. And one of the big benefits of decarbonising the grid are also new industrial processes are decarbonised or partly decarbonised, which means the products that go into buildings will use less energy in the in being made which is an impact. So we talk a lot about 15-minute cities. I think many leaders will be, um, and people have heard about that, but it's super important, as Ollie pointed out earlier, transport is a massive part of the energy mix and development. So actually having things that are close by, in France, they say you need to do laundry within 10 minutes walk, and it's that kind of, <laughs> that kind of principle <laughs> that you need to be able to get close to. So I think really encouraging that. I know there's really good work going on in Regen and various different councils and bodies by pushing that so we actually get kind of ecosystem of shops, offices and all of that built into uh, planning infrastructure. Next one please. And so I thought we'd end on a fourth opportunity and then perhaps maybe introduce who's here and then uh, get our panellists to make some comments but in the last Labour government that we had um, there was a real focus on regeneration of the cities, the urban task force, Whitney Rogers, lots of other things that were happening even devolution of the cities that started. Uh, so we think, you know, this next uh, possible <laughs> hopeful Labour government that we're coming in um, could really set the vision. And I think we're seeing that this week, but I think we need to really get into the details to deliver some of the stuff that's really hard. So we kind of feel there should be a, a task force, a green urban task force, which helps set the vision with uh, industry partners of all types and councils, you know, agree the strategy and put forward sort of detailed policies that can be implemented and worked on a longer term basis, so it's not just the next government. If we don't work into, into between the different parties, we're not going to get this delivered, and this is about the future. So that's introduction from us. I'll hand back to the, the chair.
Crowley, uh, thanks, John. Um, now, you wait ages for mayor to turn up and then two turn up at the same time. So, um, we're really pleased um, that we've got um, two Metro mayors um, here this morning. We've got um, the East and the West. Um, so, we've got Dr Nick Johnson, um, who is the mayor of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough and all the rural bits in between. Uh, and we've got Dan Norris, who's mayor of the west of England, which inc includes uh, the towns of uh, Bristol, Bath, and again, all those rural bits um, in between. Um, I will get them to talk um, next. We've also got Mike Reader from Mace. But being as there aren't that many of us here, I think we should just go really quickly round and just explain your name, um, who you're representing, or, or where you're from. So let's start here. Uh, Councillor Mohamed Butt, uh, leader of Brent Council. Fantastic. Councillor Cooper Schiff, cabinet member for environment at Brent. Mm. Christian Clown, head of state, working with Catherine Downing. Councillor Shabam Hadley, lead member for housing services in terms Councillor Carly Lee Parkway, and cabinet member for crime, crime and safety at the London Parkway. Councillor Daddy Lee Parkway, and Charles Shabam. I'm delegate the Bath CLP and my day will work for Housing Association, so this is very interesting. Mary Jo Ed here with um, Alice Court Development Company. Uh, Mike Pennell, I'm chair of uh, North East Cambridge CLP, which is one of NIP's uh, um, mm. areas. Very grateful indeed. And then Dennis O'Keefe, also from North East Cambridge. Uh, Andrew Taylor, Group Planning Director for Kempsoe Properties, so uh, how's Fantastic, thank you. It's great coming much seamlessly arrived. Uh, as well. uh, so first of all, um, we will start with our mayors. Um, so I'm going to start off uh, with Dr. Nick. Over to you. <coughs> so yeah, uh, I'll just put it in context. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Uh, it's very interesting to see the distribution of obviously where everybody comes from, and, and I guess in terms of where I represent when people talk about Cambridge and Peterborough, there are cities, but the city of Cambridge and the city of Peterborough themselves are very different, and they present very different challenges to the cities and areas that you represent. <coughs> I, I think, first of all, I, I, I agreed and said I'd be part of this uh, discussion, and it, and it, very, it sat very comfortably with the <coughs> idea of coming along, but it was more because I wanted to listen to kind of what you two <laughs> were saying. So, I mean, you're definitely going in the right direction. Uh, and the reason I, I know it's going in the right direction is because in my own area, and let's say a very different thing, you, you can look at, say, Cambridge is particularly known as for certain things, it's quite flat, there's a lot of bicycles there, and it is kind of an area where there has been a push, uh, we have the benefit of a, a Labour MP in terms of Daniel Zeichner, a, a, a real push to kind of take this 15 minute city yeah. concept. It's possibly a bit easier there, and I've always said that if we can't get it right in Cambridge, you know, then where, where can we get it right? So I'm absolutely signed up to the idea. Having said that, one of the biggest challenges we have in our relatively small city is that then we immediately get the, the challenge of congestion, and it's hard to believe it, but air quality is, it is terrible. Uh, it, and, and certainly, and I come from a background, for those who don't know, um, I kind of almost accidentally turned out to be a mayor a year ago and I was um, the reason I brought a badge on there at the end because my, my day job is still a children's doctor at one of the other hospitals in, in Cambridgeshire um, now I don't do that very much now and I, I'm more of a mayor and one of the things that I identified in me drove me to kind of say well what are we going to do in this challenge that you um, take forward is recognising that it can't be right that before I even ever met a child and their family I could look at their postcode and I can make a judgment about their welfare, mm. about their... Um, <coughs> thinking about something like asthma management, mm. I could say, I know where, which road they live on, I know they're close to this you know, dual mm. carriageway, and those sorts of things will affect their long-term outcome. So that's been very much my driving force. So I, the reason I mention that is I think all of us will have our own uh, experiences that are brought us into politics, and all of us will kind of have experience through education, it could be through probation, it could be through uh, safety. You mentioned, you mentioned safety of the streets down there. All of those, design is important as how we bring cities together, how we work together. And all I would say, and, I, and I'll, I'll cut it to a chase because it's very flowery what I'm saying, is that um, I got elected along the lines of saying there's three 
values that you have to put down. And now Alex will recognise these because I put it all over the campaign. There's three C's: compassion, cooperation, and community. And now you could put the fourth C is climate, you know, and you know, the dear, you know, the important. But all I know is that in terms of developing policy about retrofitting homes, designing cities 15 minutes with improved public transport. If the communities, if the people who are you are represented recognise that you genuinely care, you care as an architect, you care as a politician, you care as a, a local teacher, and, and, and this is this thing, this compassion, that you have to focus, because the minute you get compassion coming out of your policy development, the people who you try to convince, and this is the, the big thing about retrofitting, is it scares people because it costs a lot of money. It does. We have to be able to take people with us and be respected that any changes that we make in investment, it's a just transition as much as anything else. So well, focus on the compassion. You get the cooperation from the very people who you're hoping to kind of uh, sort of deliver, and then you deliver for the community. And that's a message that I say on repeat over and over again. Um, I will be guided by the experts. I'll be guide, guided by the experts in architecture. I will be guided by the experts in retrofit, and I will be guided by the experts in public transport. But in terms of those who are here who represent, never be shy of talking about compassion as the main thing to get the cooperation that delivers the benefit to the community. I said that over and over again. Thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, Nick. Uh, right, so from the flatlands of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough over to the hills of Bristol and Bath. Well, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Nick, and, and thank you all. Uh, and thank you, Ollie and John, uh, for um, today's event. I really pr appreciate it. Now, um, it's true, Nick does do two jobs, and as I came in, he put a sphygmonometer around my arm, and he's very tall for an eight-year-old. <laughs> so there is some confusion occasionally, isn't there? Yeah, that's true. Now, uh, my region is very different to Cambridgeshire in terms of uh, its geography, really. Um, not just do we have some really big cities like Bristol uh, within my region, but we have some very steep hills. In fact, uh, Vale Street is the steepest hill in England, uh, in Bristol, in Tottenham, if you know it. Uh, and so it's a very different challenge. And it's one of the reasons, for example, we have a, an e-scooter trial uh, that's going on at the moment. It's the most successful in the country. Uh, and I've worked out that it's, it's simply because we have very steep hills, including in Bath, as, as the comrade over there will testify. Uh, and so there are different challenges in different places. And I think that's something that we have to recognize, um, that there are local solutions very often to some of the, the key challenges that we have. Now, across the West of England region, there are about a quarter of a million homes that need retrofitting. Uh, and if you think about it, you've got these very beautiful Georgian terraces and, and curbs and, and all the rest of it. Uh, you've got the, some of the grander houses in Bristol, some of the regular housing stock in Bristol. And you've got some lovely cottages in the very beautiful rural parts of the west of England, uh, made out of white limestone with no gap in the middle, solid, no foundations in many instances, in fact. So you've got a whole range of challenges that need to be met. But those challenges do need to be met uh, because we have a very progressive set of communities in the west of England. Um, we are very ahead on uh, things like the environment. It's the, you know, my region is the region where uh, Extinction Rebellion was created. So there's a lot of pressure to kind of get on with things and do things uh, quite rightly in my view. I genuinely believe there's a climate emergency. Uh, when I was uh, in the last Labour government um, uh, as Environment Minister, uh, I remember my civil servants coming to me uh, and to give me all these statistics. And it seems to me it's even worse now. And very little actually has been done. Uh, certainly not enough compared to the challenge over the last 12 years. Uh, so we've got some real challenges there. So what do we do about it? Well, I think, first of all, transport is a key thing. Um, we really do need to have a transport system uh, that works for the people for all the reasons you will understand, getting to and from work, study, social reasons, etc. But we've got to get people out of cars, so that means behaviour change. Uh, and getting people into public transport is not just about good bus fares and other forms of public transport um, uh, and making it affordable. It's actually about making sure the buildings tie in very closely to what you're doing. So, you know, you've got to make sure that this distance thing, whether that's 15 minutes or, or, or a 10 minute belongery or, or whatever you decide, uh, it's more than just one element. Everything has to be knitted together really, really effectively. Uh, I love the ideas about the stamp duty to get a refund. I think that's really sensible. I, I'm quite encouraged to hear that. That's something I certainly think about, and that's what we need a Labour government to do, frankly, because uh, although Metro Mayors cover large areas and large populations, 
truth is there's not enough national steer going on. Uh, you know, what I could do is so much more if I had a, a national government. I'll give you a, a good example of that. Um, my big headache at the moment on public transport is a shortage of bus drivers. I'm sure it's the same for you too, Nick, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, that should be controlled nationally. Uh, it's been warned about for years, about seven years or more, that there'll be a shortage of bus drivers uh, and HGV drivers, actually. Uh, and then the wonderful government in their wisdom wrote to every bus driver saying, why don't you be an HGV driver when there wasn't <laughs> enough food on supermarket shelves? And guess what's happened? We now ha I, ha I now have more money than I can spend on public transport because I don't have the drivers to drive the buses that I could pay for, which is kind of nonsensical. So we need a lot of joining up to, 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 be, to be sorted out. Um, I suppose the other thing is we've got to try and make it, those cities are really important, I think we have to try and make it so that whatever community you're in, whether you're in a market town or a, in a remote rural area, you feel connected to this challenge. Because actually, to solve it, we all have to play our part, every single one of us as individuals, in our own individual behaviour, as well as our workplace, as well as everywhere else. So that is the big, big challenge, <coughs> is getting everything joined up and linked together. And that's where national government comes in, frankly. Uh, because it can create rules and laws and all the rest of it to kind of force through a way of looking at the challenge and then finding agreed solutions that are going to work effectively. Mm. Um, I suppose the other thing I'd, I'd want to say is we do need to somehow have a way of taking, Nick's point about taking people along with us is very important because these projects don't happen just like that. They, they take time. I mean, if I were to sign up to the most wonderful public transport system tomorrow, take over 12, 13 years before it actually was delivered. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, people are still waiting for their bus or not, uh, as the case may be, they're still desperate to get around. So you have to set up appropriate expectations uh, so that you are measured against those uh, challenges, so that you're able to say, well, look, you know, you haven't got the final thing, but I did promise you'd have really good quality bus stops or whatever it might be. Because you've got to take people with you, otherwise they'll lose faith and they'll end up voting Tory again. And, be, and that's what we've got to be really smart about. So we do have to set, set out a lot of, of strong expectations. So I think I, I'm not going to carry on too much. I'm going to get my stick manometer now and I'm yeah. going to test everybody's blood pressure because I'm very jealous of Nick multitasking. Um, but, but seriously, what I think we all need to do is not forget the importance of a Labour government. And um, I know you're all saying, well, we want a Labour government. But look, getting a Labour government and wanting one is a different thing. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I think you probably all agree there's a bit of a buzz around it at this conference in a way that perhaps there hasn't been in recent years uh, about the prospect of winning. And I think that is a very real prospect. But let me tell you, complacency is our biggest danger. We cannot be complacent. We have got to make that happen. We have to look credible. Uh, we have to look the part as well as have the policies. Uh, and the Tories are ruthless. Uh, I've been around long enough to see them. They think power is in their entitlement. And because of that, they do anything and spend anything, actually, any resource that they've got to keep onto that power. So for us to do it, we've got to be smart. And one of the areas we can be smart on is retrofitting uh, sustainable development and really being ambitious with our targets. We have a net zero 2030 target in my region. The Labour, the Labour Party is now saying nationally that it's got 2030 target too. I think that's absolutely right. I think we've got to be super ambitious and drive that urgency. Um, otherwise, we won't deal with the problem. So anyway, I've taken a lot of your time. Thank you very much for listening to me. Yeah. Thanks for questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> to the left, that's all right. I don't mind. Yeah. Thanks, Dan. Uh, we'll go over to Mike now. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I guess I'm here to be the industry voice on sustainable regeneration. I work for MACE. We are the largest constructor in London. Uh, involved some amazing regeneration schemes, LLDC in the Olympic Park. Uh, Euston, which will become an amazing new development, and of course some work in Greenwich as well. But actually Mace is the largest British-owned consultancy, construction consultancy in the world, so we have a real reach and across cities globally, which enables us to really learn from how different countries are doing it. Um, when I was sort of thinking about today, I wanted to park London, so sorry to friends from Poplar and Newham and Brent, but London is its own challenge in itself. It's, it's the only city under the Tories that has continued to level up despite all the rhetoric that the rest of the country needs to, re to level up instead. Um, and, and whilst I see a place for some of the trendy ideas like 15-minute neighbourhoods and the idea that everyone can cycle to work, living in smaller cities through most of my life, I probably don't see them as likely uh, as being a solution in places like where I've lived, like Southampton, and now actually live in Northampton, which is a, 
a large a large town, which also has an e-scooter trial, which is very successful. Um, again, hills, uh, the, the bane of cyclists. Um, I think we have to think of cities as the nucleus, as, as Dan talked about, with the market towns and the villages around them. Having grown up in a market town, getting the Solent Blue Line bus into Southampton every weekend with my friends, an hour and a half on the bus just to get into town to go shopping or go to the cinema. Um, we have to think about how we connect our cities out into the surrounding towns and neighbourhoods that feed into them. And therefore, sustainable transport and um, connectivity, for me, is a really big driver in how we regenerate our cities uh, across, across the UK. We are in a bit of a, a time of radical change. There's changing commuter habits, which is having a massive impact in cities on both the daytime and the nighttime economy and transport need. Um, when I get the train in on a Friday, to, I, I travel um, from Northampton to London, I'm probably the only person on the train now. And there are schemes that have been planning for years that now are no longer viable to deliver. The, 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 the level of uh, people on the trains on a Friday is less than weekends, which is a big trend um, that we're seeing across the UK. Um, there's a change in demand for services. You know, the, the, the pandemic has, has changed the way that we live. A, a reliance more on delivery services and just-in-time access to uh, information and services means that we need to rethink how those cities support people in living how they want to live now. Um, and also there's a change in demand because of the recession. We're seeing, it, and, and Mace as a developer, is seeing it harder to secure funding. Inflation definitely isn't helping with that, but also supply chain challenges across the industry are making development funding a lot harder to secure, particularly at the scale that delivers large-scale regeneration in cities and towns. Um, but I think we should see that as an opportunity, because I think gone are the days when we see billion pound regeneration schemes announced by councils and politicians that they're going to change. As, as my colleagues have pointed out, you know, if you announce today a transport scheme at three billion, by the time it's finished, it'll be about eight billion, and maybe about 10 years late. <laughs> you know, my industry is not very good at delivering large scale infrastructure in the UK. We don't, for whatever reason, we don't get things right. Crossrail is a great example of that, but we don't get things right, and we still need to learn. And I think we're still at a very immature stage in our industry about how we deliver those major uh, transformational infrastructure programs. I hope through HS2, the investment in HS2, we'll see those skills developed now, which will help us to transition to a more greener um, uh, uh, economy and uh, transport network. But I'm going to challenge Nick on his perception that retrofit is, is more expensive than new build. Because it, it genuinely isn't, and, and not only in terms of the capital cost, but the, the whole life value and the value for taxpayers of reusing existing assets rather than building new has to be at the forefront of every local authority, every metro mayor, and every government body that exists in the UK. Um, the value of uh, addressing the massive carbon sink and emissions, challenge, uh, emissions that are, are generated by the, our built environment. 28% of emissions in the UK come from the built environment. Um, and 80% of buildings, when we reach 2050 and want to be carbon neutral, 80% of those buildings have already been built and we need to be made carbon neutral by the time we get to 2050. So reusing buildings, promoting small scale, tangible regeneration that people can see and feel on the ground has to be, in my view, going forward, how we uh, move forward with regeneration in our cities. Um, coming to the four points that uh, colleagues uh, raised. Retrofit has to be number one, and fabric first retrofit for me is an absolute priority. That we fix leaky, drafty buildings that are inefficient to heat. So not only does that make the building lower carbon, but it actually puts money back in the pockets of businesses and people who, could, who drive our economy. So if we can address our existing building stock, both public and private, make it work better for us and make it more efficient, we're doing something great for the planet and great for our communities. Net zero carbon energy, completely agree, connectivity. Now, you know, we all talk about skill shortages, and, and I, I picked up your point on a, a, a skills challenge. Mace, is, um, our CEO, is the chair of the Discussion Leadership <coughs> Council. We work with the Prime Minister's Office and the Cabinet um, to advise them on um, what the construction industry needs, and it's a, a group of the, the, the major players in the industry. Uh, we're working on a skills plan, but I was on a panel yesterday, and, and one of the biggest challenges we have is a rotating door of ministers. By the time we've got a, minister, a construction minister up to speed of our industry, they've already moved on and another one's in. Same with housing, a big challenge. Um, and therefore, it's a constant process of re-education 
of, of uh, Tory ministers to get them to really realise the challenge. But actually, but there's a skill shortage in almost every industry. Skill shortage of, of buses uh, picked up by Dan. So we are working with governments to try and address that. But actually, we're probably going to address it by changing the way we build rather than just getting more skills. So the, in, the industry skills plan is coming. I'm sure a change in leader of the Tory party means it'll be further delayed in announcement. Um, but we are pushing forward on that. But net zero carbon energy, fantastic. And there, and there is a skill shortage of people who work out how you connect developments to the grid. So again, we're seeing stalling of viable green developments because we haven't got the people to work out how we connect to the grid. So locally distributed energy, controlled energy, that as your neighbour's solar panels are generating electricity and, you're not, and they're not using it, it comes into your home and makes your, 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 the price of your electricity lower. That community-led energy um, is a fantastic way, but at the moment the grid doesn't support that and we need a transformational change in how we um, engage uh, new developments into the existing Grid. I won't talk about 15 minute neighbourhoods because I, 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 they're, they're very, very good for London and Paris. I, I'm not sure. um, but yeah, green urban and, and biodiversity is the next big challenge that we face in the industry. Um, we're seeing a big push on carbon, um, May supports and buys from net, net zero steel. All our steel comes from net zero sources. We're trialling low carbon concrete on some of our buildings. Out. Um, but actually biodiversity is probably the big challenge that we're going to face in our cities going forward. And if we can make sure that planning regulations and developments consider a, po a net positive biodiversity improvement, then we're going to make our cities greener uh, in the long term. And I hope that Labour will support that going forward when we come into government, hopefully sooner rather than later. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much. I know Dan's got to get away to another event, um, but that's good. Um, so um, it's going to be very much over to uh, you now to try and kick off the conversation. So who wants to who wants to start us off? Holly, that way. Yeah, yeah Mike and I'm from uh, North East Cambridgeshire. Um, I live in a small town just outside Peterborough, and yeah. Transport links are an absolute uh, issue for us because um, Stagecoach have just announced that they're going to be axing uh, a number of services, which means that some of our villages will have no uh, public transport system whatsoever. So, uh, yeah, transport. I'm really concerned mostly about the, uh, the issue of, uh, of planning laws and regulations. Because I would like to see, um, particularly new build, but also in relation to uh, retrofit, that um, standards have to be raised, required standards have to be raised. Um, on the question of new builds, I mean, uh, my, uh, my small town is actually being uh, massively enlarged by, uh, by Persimmon, who uh, I'm sure um, most of you are aware are not the most uh, socially responsible of, uh, of developers. And um, I just look at what they're building. They have token, um, they've made a token effort on the on the solar panels. They have four panels on the roofs of uh, some of their some of their buildings. They can't put any more on there. That's too small because the roof trusses are made of matchsticks, virtually. You know, they, they can't take the weight. So there's there's got to be um, improvements in the uh, in the building rates. Um, and in the in the east of England, um, this affects the cities and rural. Um, is the question of, uh, of water. We have, uh, we have a serious problem in the east of England with um, water uh, use. Um, when we have the drought like we've had recently, uh, it, it's affecting the agriculture and it's going to affect, if it continues like this, it will affect water supply to, uh, to, uh, to homes and, uh, and to businesses. So uh, those, those are issues that have to, be, have to be seriously dealt with. And I would like to see we talk about the removal of VAT on, uh, on retrofit. Um, just to th throw out a little uh, possibility, how about imposing um, something like a 20% uh, VAT on new build, rebated against um, environmental, environmental measures? So 5% for, so for solar panels, 5% uh, for uh, ground source heat pumps and so on. Great. Should we go over to Mohammed now? Thanks very much. 
um, Oliver, Oliver, John, thank you for uh, organising the event today as well. Uh, you know, um, funny enough, uh, when we're talking about sort of sustainability in planning and regeneration uh, and designing out city, uh, uh, Krupa, was, was, so Krupa just, was just having a meeting yesterday with our planning planning team, uh, just making sure uh, that everything that we're doing uh, has that sustainability sort of built into it and, and designing in some of our policies. Uh, so that so that as we move forward, right, uh, we're having those conversations, right. But but when it comes to retrofit, uh, just to give you one example, right, if I was to just to uh, um, uh, um, retrofit the council housing stock, right, uh, um, which is only about twelve thousand units, and but then I've got some extra units, and everything else, right. I would need in the region of nearly two billion quid. Right, in order to just to uh, do some of those street properties, right, and then if if I go start looking into the uh, the blocks right, that, that that need that, that retrofit element, right, uh, who's going who's going to pay that two billion pound, right, and uh, and uh, uh, I, I know I know I know you're taking, talking about London being so, you know well off as such, right, but uh, uh, there are pockets of of such high levels of deprivation, mm -hmm. right, uh, uh, Stonebridge Ward is one of the most deprived wards I have in in, in Brent. Uh, and uh, the, the, the average wage there is, is about eighteen thousand pounds, and, and all of those individuals are living in council homes. Right? And if they didn't have those council homes, right, that I would have to take a look at, right, move them outside of London, right. So where do they go, right? We're not even building the homes that we, we need, uh, uh, and uh, and that's where uh, I mean uh, I've in Brent in the last ten years, I. Uh, uh, I've been sort of making sure right, that we're, we're building the homes that people need, right, and having the conversations with with developers coming in. And if it, uh, and I will shake hands with anyone I've got because uh, the the need is so high, isn't it, in order to to get that. So so how, uh, I mean, trying to tackle retrofit, right, is is, is going to be a, a massive challenge, right, for 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 so a just lot to of add to that, yeah. um, We did one flat in Halstead, yeah. which is in Brent. And that costs two hundred ninety-three thousand just to retrofit. Just one. Yeah. Right. It's honestly right. It's just trying to find <laughs> the, 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 the opportunities to do that in, in some of those properties. Right. So it's, it's going to be challenging, but but I don't, I don't think it should stop us. Right. I, and still in having these conversations and making sure uh, that, that the pledges and everything and the commitments made by Ed, Ed oh. and, and, the, and the Labour front bench. Right, we need to sort of, I think, uh, welcome it with open arms, right? Uh, and yes, it may cost 60 billion, 80 billion, 90 billion, right, uh, in order to do it, right? But I think uh, the cost is even worse if we don't actually take that on, right? And I know uh, that, that the, the, the announcements, made, announcements made last Friday have had a negative impact, haven't they, right? In relation to uh, um, uh, the economy and, uh, and the state of Britain, right? But, but so some of these things that we're looking to do, right, will have a positive impact, right? Uh, in relation to um, energy, actually, because uh, we haven't even got the infrastructure in place, have we, uh, for electric vehicles, right? And I want to change over to electric vehicle, right? But I, I, I've decided to go for hybrid, right? Because uh, I've got that range anxiety to my mind, right? Will, will I will I get to where I need to go, right? So, so it's all these kind of things, right? Uh, until uh, until we we, we 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 have the planning systems right, that allow councils actually. Uh, to to uh, to do what they need to do for their individual respective boroughs, uh, and 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 work with the mayor of London as well, right, uh, in order to get some of those uh, uh, larger transport infrastructure things. Uh, and and the point you made about uh, the, uh, the the bus drivers and the HGV drivers, right? Honestly, uh, uh, we had a massive impact on uh, on on uh, our waste collection service right? because we didn't have the drivers, right, uh, to pick up the waste. Right, so, so how do we manage the waste issue as well, right? right when it comes to recycling, reuse, and everything else, right, there, there's so many things we, we need to pick up on, right, in order to get there, right? But I welcome the conversation, John. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> And then we'll come back yeah. to the panel, yeah? I think, um, perhaps just about that, I think one of the things where we've been looking at, obviously, retrofit is not a big, massive uh, capital works program. Yeah. Currently, happening in new, but um, we've not invested in our stock for over nine years. So we're playing catch up. And the thing we're really worried about, you know, obviously, we're talking about S&T pumps, yeah. but technology is changing. Yeah, so so is. we had a company come <coughs> last week looking at. Uh, putting in 
hybrid inverters um, into our depot to make that self-sustain. So we're trying to but use that model on our estate as well, so we can make our estates self-sustained, so you know, they generate their own electricity. But I think the main thing is going to be cost. I think, you know, if that is what we've got to really look at the cost of the retrofit. Because no matter how much you talk, talk about it, I think, you know, we, we've got planned years ahead and see, and the technology right. Because, you know, um, for us in Newham, I think we went through a phase where decided to put CCTV cameras in everywhere and they were they were animal. And yeah. a year later yeah. digital well, come out. So you know you've got to keep up with technology, you've got to get it right. But I think we need to actually have a, a real strategy on what we want and the cost of it and how we're going to sustain it. And I think that's going to be the big uh, big question and uh, one of the areas we're looking at batteries as well battery technology to do that hybrid so, you know, I think it's going to be a big, big question and I think we have to look at it and the company we had, I won't talk about it, but they came in and they had something different to hybrid inverters in terms of water heating, heating. So, technology is changing, but I think we have to make sure that we get the right systems in and, you know, we're not constantly five years down the line looking at a different system and upgrading it and then cost to the tenants, cost to the council, will we have that money? Okay, we'll come back to our panel then. Thank you. Um, so, lots to comment on there transport, planning, energy bills, um, skills. Look out for Keir's speech later. And Stan is going to be a line in there about consolidating adult education budgets for Metro Mayor. So. Thank you very much. Um, I'll pick up on a couple of points and I'm sure others got here as well. Um, I think just going back to the speakers and, and things as well, I think with the Labour Party conference, it's interesting hearing of Keir's and we'll talk on some of some bits later, um, is that compassion is incredibly important. Um, and I think the cost of living crisis, a lot of these crises are all building up together. That's why I think uh, retrofitting will reduce people's bills and it's often the poorest that are affected by that. So I think there's a whole kind of series of reasons why some of these measures can be very positive and for the Labour government. Um, so I encourage them to, to promote them, both in terms of job creation as well. So we've got economic <coughs> as um, I mentioned earlier. Um, I think the local point is very important, the flexibility around retrofit. I think, um, I, think I, I talked about the 1820 law, you know, and I think we've got to look at trying to get the good wins on uh, retrofit. So I think thinking about the policies and how they're implemented so for some places it may not be worth kind of whipping the whole building down and spending you know half a million pounds per house because it's just not viable. No. Whereas if you could do something for thirty thousand or ten thousand or whatever it is, um, but it does quite a lot of work. So I think you need some creative thinking and some, some long term plan. Um, and <coughs> sort of on, on that same point, and I think it's because it's always going to come back to cost on, on retrofit. What you saw with um, feed-in tariffs sort of yeah. 10, 15 years ago was that it's gone. it incentivised the price, it incentivised the demand for solar, which then brought the price down because there was so much more of it that, that prices came, came down. And I think you would get the same effect if you did something like a uh, stamp duty rebate on uh, a, a new building. So it's, it's only going to be the private, you know, people, private owners will get a, would get a rebate if they got their EPC rating from a C to an A. As an example, that would create a lot of demand for retrofit. So you'd suddenly have demand for these skills, you'd have demand for these technologies, and that would then bring down the cost of the whole of it, so that it was then more affordable for the public sector. And then, you know, that, that's the sort of that's the sort of kind of strategic thinking that we're, we're kind of encouraging that would have the net effect of bringing down the cost. Okay. Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you for the invitation. I think what we've demonstrated in over the course of an hour is uh, that you can pull together a group of strangers uh, yeah. and we've all focused on maybe different solutions for our different areas but ultimately it's the same problem that we're trying to solve so we need to reduce the amount of CO2 in the environment. Um, I think what I get out of these meetings and I said at the start, I, I'm there to listen, is a sense of um, we're all in it together. Uh, we, we come together as you know, representatives of our local areas along the ideas of democratic socialism 
what we're trying to say is we shouldn't be complacent and sort of done and sort of alluded to. It may be great that at the end of this conference we're all going to go home and we're going to hear a, a leader's speech, uh, which will be upbeat, uh, being told that there's a buzz about the place. But we can't just assume that uh, that's going to make the delivery of a Labour government. It's, it's, let's be clear, one of the reasons we're doing so well <coughs> the current government is doing very, very badly. My thoughts are, and I will put myself out there and offer it if, it's, if there's uh, a desire, is that when you get professionals like yourself thinking what can we do to help you know, discuss the problem, we're going to avoid the situation that it becomes a, a talking shop. But if we all go away from this, then okay, it doesn't matter if you're in Brent, it doesn't matter if you're in North East Kentshire, yeah. and it doesn't matter if you're in Scotland or Northern Ireland, is that we as representatives of the people of the of the Labour Party, we're going to work on these policies. And sometimes it is going to cost money, sometimes there is going to be these things. But going back to that thing, it will be more than one about what the pros and cons about how much finance. It will be about delivering and caring because to reduce the inequalities, going back to that thing of compassion. So let's just kind of work, you know, take away from this meeting the desire to work together, reduce those inequalities. It's the thing we do this because it's the right thing to do, not because there's money in it. It's the right thing to do for us, for our communities, for our families, and, and, and ultimately for the environment. Thank you. Right, we'll be back to you. Have we got any more questions, points? We do as well. I was also thinking we had in the mini budget um, the um, um, announcements about accelerated delivery. Now, I think everyone wants accelerated delivery, but I was wondering how we do it in a labour way. Because I have a feeling that what the Tories mean by accelerated delivery is, you know, killing all the mutants and getting rid of any kind of, you know, um, targets for affordable housing. How do we make sure that we can come up with a plan for accelerated delivery that, that works in a way that, you know, works for, for people right across our country? Right, over to you. So I think it, it ties in with that. I think you should, you know, if you're recladding buildings, it's a great opportunity to improve insulation and everything else. Um, in terms of funding models, I think um, I think some of the suggestions we've made today, which is about kind of kind of developing the market um, and to do the, the, the cuts in that, I think would make a significant impact. Um, I don't know if you've got any more. But no, I think I mean, that's the problem. Is that, you know, the, 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 the new computer stuff didn't really work. Yeah. And, you know, the uptake's been really limited and. So therefore, there's a bit of a vacuum of, of opportunities for funding in this at the moment. <laughs> so yeah, I, think, I guess that is something that the Labour Party could be looking at in terms of how they do that. And I think how that 60 billion is spent yeah. and distributed uh, in the amount of is absolutely key mm -hmm. breaking down into new local policies. But I think that you're right, that is the absence of space. There's, you know, I think we know how to do it, but we don't necessarily know how to afford it. So I think we'll have to break it down. We're seeing in the commercial sector that uh, access to finance for development is now linked to the greenness of development. Mm. Um, you know, massive institutions like BlackRock have now come out and said, you know, they're only investing in uh, green development. And, and there was a, a good sign of the finance market is to read the letter from the CEO of BlackRock. He does it really, because it gives a good sign. And they've made that, that clear to these you know, billions and billions and billions of pounds of investment fund that 
investing in green development is where they want to go as, a, as an investment body. We're also seeing in the commercial sector that there is definite evidence in London, at least, that greener buildings are achieving higher rents. And we'll only see that increasing as companies more and more um, wants to demonstrate their green credentials. And as a net zero carbon business, and they went net zero carbon in 2020, we're now seeing our competitors scrabbling to kind of follow up and therefore, you know, green, sustainable, low cost to run commercial property um, is is in high demand in London. So I, I, I think that will follow through to the housing sector. So there isn't a solution now. There is obviously Salex and the Public Sector Decarbonisation Fund and those types of things that you could consider in a total funding package for housing regeneration. Um, but I think over the coming years, the focus of green funding, green-backed funding, um, will mean that when you're coming to regenerate or redevelop your housing stock, if you're making energy improvements, then that funding will be more, more accessible to, to, to deliver it in, in terms of public borrowing. So I think there isn't a necessary solution now, but we're seeing a trend in the macro of, of the kind of development finance that that, that, is, that is on its way. There's some, there's some good signs that the, the development finances are, are kind of uh, supporting green and sustainable development. So, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. That was a very good point. I think ESG funds are a good thing. I actually contacted yesterday about from a major fund who wants to kind of put that together in a, a refund package, if you like, that they then offer out to different businesses and councils and stuff. So I think that I was at the, um, the business uh, <coughs> Uber event uh, yesterday, and uh, he had talked a lot about sort of public private partnerships and working together. And I think that's what, where, what he needs. It's a problem too big to solve for alone. Uh, councils can't solve the loan, the government can't solve the you know, loan. So I think we will see some uh, connect up between you know, uh, industry and funding. So I think that's where we can perhaps start pushing make sure that they go that there's long term investment for the government so that they can invest some private money into the into the sector. Can, can, can yeah, I'm talking to yeah. you five minutes left, okay. so yep. Yeah, uh, uh, the the issue about sort of finance and funding, I uh, I mean uh, um uh, before I came up to conference I was having a conversation with my finance director and, and chief exec and housing uh, uh, d directors, right, and um, because the, 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 the current situation, right, is that we're finding it, right, right, that all our costs and everything else have gone through the roof, haven't they, right? Uh, and th th there's one what, what, one project, right, where, where it's supposed, to, it was going to be totally sustainable, 100% you know, sustainable, right, um, because it all stacked up, right, and then the, 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 obviously. The, 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 the financial costs have gone through the, uh, through the roof, the construction costs have gone through the roof, labour costs have gone through, supply chains have gone through the roof, right? Uh, uh, and I, I now have a £30 million gap in order to, to, to make that building work, right? The, the only way I can now make it work, right, is to go back to flipping concrete, right, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and normal construction methods, right? So, so everything I did in order to to have a fully sustainable building, right, mm. has been blown out the window, right, in order to make sure I, I get the 64 homes, right, uh, that, 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 or I, I reduce the number of homes that I have, I reduce the, the number of, you know, of uh, the, the space I have in order to create um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the workspaces that people need, right, right? and, and it, it does actually come down to one thing, right, the funding, right, right? and if, if we don't get the, 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 the economics right in order to enable uh, councils and uh, uh, other institutions, to, to developers to come together in order to uh, in effect that, uh, uh, that positive change. Uh, we, we are going to have sort of, you know, a, a massive impact. Uh, even, it's even going through the Public Works Loan Board at the moment, right? It, it's, not, it's not really cheap right, uh, uh, um, to get that funding. Right? I, I, and uh, I've tried to go out into the private sector in order to attract that funding, like you get the pension funds in and have those conversations, because you know, they, they do see councils as you know secure funding, don't they? But, uh, but, but even then, now three right, minutes left. And it's it's going to be quite difficult. <laughs> that way, and then back yeah. to our. Yeah, I, I think the main issue here is I think you know, are having are having having a bit of money? Are they enough? Are, you know, we've got thirty grand to make this, mm. and you know, it's going to take us years and years. Uh, yeah. even, on the, even on temporary accommodation, we roughly need 
for up to 600 properties coming in every year yeah, gotcha. just to make that build. So I think you know, when you talk about financing, we have to make financing cheaper. And, and so it's a question of space for the council and it's been better in our residents as well. I think when we look at Let you guys do it. our residents in, in the borough, and we have to sometimes move them to neighbouring boroughs and it's the cost Hello. of you know, moving Hello. those residents to neighbouring boroughs. And the other thing, the other issue here is, is you know, London is getting denser and denser and denser. And I think, you know, we have to start looking at putting quite proper transport links in to more out of borough towns. So, you know, that those links are there and, and we are going to need regeneration. I think whatever way you look at it, regeneration is going to be, where we're trying to say to us that, that regeneration, just to meet the demand, of our way is we're going to have to constantly invest in regeneration, regenerating our estates. So again, we have to get make sure the funding is there, the finance sourcing is correct, and we have to drive that change forward. And you know, retrofit is going to be coming in, fire safety bills are going to be coming in. And there's so many, so much happening in housing at the moment. You know, there's not enough time to actually comprehend, comprehend everything that's going on. Brilliant, thank you. Right, with our final minute, we're going to whiz back through. Very quick one, uh, John and Ollie. So you've got the ear of two cabinet members from Newham, cabinet member and leader of Brent, a uh, directly elected mayor. <laughs> what should the public sector be doing now to better engage companies like yourselves to deliver green infrastructure and green development? And any kind of summing up you want to do it for, <laughs> yes. for me, I think it's uh, you know, set, set the vision. Um, I think. There's, you're right, it's constantly moving fire regulations, constantly moving environmental regulations. I think, you know, as a local authority, you need to set the kind of North Star of what you're trying to achieve, and, and, and then we can buy into that and assist where we can. That, that would be mine. I think, on a similar note, I think some flexibility in thinking. Yeah. Um, every project that we take the road doing retrofit, so we kind of do early engagement and working with partners to so that we can actually come up with a clever plan to make it happen. And then I think we could put some policy weight, given locally, on sort of in favour, further in favour of uh, sustainability and yeah, other things really so that you can actually get it over the line of committee because of, often our you know clients, the biggest thing they want is a consent and yeah. actually they will work towards it. They know it gives them a better chance of getting a consent, then they will work towards that. So I think, uh, yeah, policy <coughs> regionally is super important. Thank you. I think this is about people. And I think sometimes that when we're talking about planning, you know, what we're actually talking about is people's energy needs, <coughs> that people have got somewhere to be able to live, somewhere they can afford to all hope, you know, a place that they can get around. And actually it's about pride in local communities as well. So I think actually that's what this discussion is all about. And I think when we are going back to our constituencies um, and talking to the Labour Party about our policy, it really is about making sure we put people at the heart of it the whole time. So thank you ever so much um, for coming along to this morning's uh, meeting. Uh, big thanks um, to Mike and to Nick, to Dan before, um, and to um, Ollie and to John Duke for sponsoring us and providing all the, all the breakfast for us as well, which we definitely enjoyed. And most of all, thanks ever so much to you for coming along. I um, hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you.